So if you guys log in. The other thing I finally did was re-remember how to give you the analytics. So the analytics, I don't know if they show up live or what. Yes, and I will deny at approving posting media. Um, I don't know if the analytics show up live, but maybe we'll look at them in a minute. But if you can log into that slide of 402846, we're going to finish up last week, and then we'll go to this week's topics on configuration design. Okay. Um, I do apologize. I went to go make see why the video hadn't shown up from last week. And it seems that the uh, wonderful podcasting system is so crap that it just throws an error. Unknown. So, um, last week's video uh, does not exist as far as I can tell. Um, so, I do apologize on that. Um, it's one of these great things that I just don't know why. In, in great, great fashion, they also didn't open the doors. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll close that one. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, we'll get to those before we move on. So let's open this last question, Seth. Um, and this is about actually selecting your design point once you have all the constraints. This is the actual act of sizing. When you select that design point, you have sized your aircraft. So with the information, your design information, uh, design choices such as aspect ratio and the like, <coughs> and with your estimation, of initial estimate, weight estimation, by selecting that design point, you have determined the wing is, how big your engines have to be, and now we have a size concept. We haven't represented it as anything, so you don't know what the fuselage looks like, you don't know what the control surfaces are, but you have your basic size concept. And then you can use that to build your configuration. Once you have your initial configuration, you can start analyzing different aspects of it. You can do a more detailed estimation of weight, component weight, wing weight. I know how big my wing is, I know how deep my wing is, I can estimate how much it weighs, I can iterate on my gross weight, and capability, I can see if I need more thrust, if I miss the performance things, I can then do more detailed NPM as I build up my structure, I can do better aerodynamic analysis. So it is at this point we have an aircraft. Okay, so that's why this is really important. You choose this point wrong, your aircraft is going to be crap. Nothing you will do after the fact will fix it. Okay? A bad concept cannot be made good. A good concept can be destroyed by bad management. So, um, so that's why this is important. Okay. First question, in the absence of other analysis, hint, hint, this is one of those things that you will get knocked on, why should you always place your design point on an active constraint? What we mean by active constraint is that's a constraint that, border, that divides the border between the available design space and the unavailable design space, i.e. those thrust weights and wing loadings that do not meet the constraints you put in. They can't take off in the allowable distance. They can't cruise at initial cruise altitude. They have a ceiling that's too low. They can't turn. They can't do whatever it happens to be. Okay? You have other constraints that are in that space, meaning they're not the ones that make that decision. 
Those are called inactive constraints. And as long as the constraint remains inactive, we don't care about it. The reason we have it on there is, say something happened in the market, that may become active. You can check that it's active. You can go back and say, now this is defining our design. This is what we have to look at. We're not going to redesign our aircraft, but we're going to adjust our estimates of the performance because it's now become active. Okay? So why do we always place it on an active constraint? The second question. On a constraints chart diagram, why do we place the design point down and to the right? Again, if we have no other information, why do we place it down and to the right? And I'll bring up a constraint side right here in a second. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. And then this one. Why does the design, where does the design point go on this chart? So to answer this question, you need to tell me which constraints are active. By the way, this design point is long, it's just a random number. But where would you actually want to put it? So which constraints are active and why down to the right? Okay, sure. Yes? When you mean by an active constraint, you mean a constraint whose line has at least one border with the available design space. Yeah, so that's an active constraint, that's an active constraint, that's an active constraint, and that one is. This ceiling is an inactive constraint. Okay. Wait, sir, when you say where does this design point go on the chart, this is at any position where we can put the design point and still have a vehicle that can work, right? Well, the vehicles work anywhere in this space, right? Yes, yes they do. They work, but that doesn't mean they're good. Right? So the, so the design yeah, I do a thrust to weight ratio of one and a wing loading of four kilonewtons per meter squared. That aircraft will fly. Yes. It will meet our constraints. It will do far better than our constraints. But it, based on what we said we want, is a really bad aircraft. Now, it maybe it's a great aircraft for something else, like, say, Taking off off a ship deck without any runoff, flying somewhere, delivering packages to unsuspecting individuals, and returning. I need to ask greater than one for that. But it's not, in this case, a very good commercial transport. <coughs> because what we'll tell you is when all is said and done, the ones down here will eat that one for lunch when it comes to costs. Okay. Might have just answered, helped you answer one of the earlier questions. Okay. So we'll come back to this one. So, 13 of you have answered these. I'll give a little bit more seconds for people to answer. Now, you will notice in the reference aircraft, I have given you a design point for each of the reference aircraft. That does not mean that's the only design point for that design. What it is, is it's a design point that you can then use when you have certain questions that are based on design points. Right? Because you may have multiple choices. We'll get back to that. And yours is as valid as mine. But if you want to, when you do the practice exam, answer, get the right answer on the multiple choice, um, you want to use that design. May not actually be a valid design point. I've just chosen it for that point. Um, okay. So, on this one, will the final aircraft be. Why do you want to always put it on an active constraint? What the hell just happened there? God damn it, I'm able to retrieve contents. Good lord. Even if it, even if it was inebriated, it would be more competent. I am still logged in. No, now I am logged out. Let's try this again. Let's cancel the wrong one. Eight, four, three, four. Connect. Well, we'll, we'll get it back in just a second. Give me a second. 
So for your personal edification, I will let you see the results as you've said it. I do knew. If I knew, I would tell you. Okay. There we go. I'm back. So. I see that 14 percent of you think you I will make you will make small children cry. <laughs> um. Now. Depending on my mood in the day, that might be actually what I want. Um, I am sometimes a bit uh, sadistic, but um, the real reason is if you move it away from that point, you are doing all of that. Your aircraft will be more expensive than necessary, will be heavier than necessary. In fact, those two are kind of linked together because all else remaining equal, a heavier aircraft costs more. Takes more material, takes more time. Obviously, there is that trade off when I'm talking about a more advanced process or more advanced material. It's lighter, but that costs more. But within a given set of processes and material, they trend together. These are the big ones, and they're very counterintuitive at times. Right, sir? Yeah. So you move your point down and do the right in order to make your air turn? If you don't do it, you will do it. Okay. Okay. Um, you may or may not make small children cry. So what you are doing by moving it away from an active constraint is you're saying, I don't trust that constraint, right? I don't trust the values that went into it. Of course I don't trust the values that went into it. But if I apply risk aversion in every step of the way, so you've chosen a CL max for takeoff or landing, you think you can get. But you said, you know what? I don't think I'm actually going to get 1.2, or I think I will, but I might not. I don't want it to go wrong. So I'm going to assume that CL max for takeoff is, instead of 2.1, is 2. That's risk aversion. You think you can get it, but you're not, you don't trust yourself, so you're going to be a little safe. And I do that on all of those things. I don't think my CD knot's going to be that low. I don't think my wing efficiency is going to be that high, blah, 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 blah. I've done all of that. I've done my sensitivity analysis. I've chosen that. I'm risk averse. I'm a human being. I don't want to get it wrong. And then I go, ooh, if I put it on that nine, I might not make it. I'll move it away. Well, now I've added more risk aversion. How much risk aversion have you added? Well, now, instead of, say, betting on uh, the expected outcome or the 50% or the 90% or the 99%, all of a sudden you're betting on, you're saying, I don't think I can get the one in one ten thousand failure point. I don't think I can achieve that. My God, man. That would be like going in and saying, I don't think I can get a zero on this exam. I mean, I know people who've gotten less than zero on an exam. Wait, that actually happens? Yep. Not here. We're not allowed to do that to you. Sorry. <laughs> as much as I would like. Um, no, yeah, I, I, had a, I had a guy I went to university with in a, in a class. Um, final exam was worth half the marks. He had a 60 going into the final exam. So theoretically, he should have to do no better than, a, no worse than a 30. He got a 22. Yep, he got less than zero on the exam. Can't do that here. So, you're being more risk aversion. Now, why do we say you are less likely to meet those goals? Design is what we call a revealed information game. And it's a real game, not chess. Sorry, that's an annoying quote. Uh, it's a real game in that you're playing with other people, you don't know what they're doing, they have all different motives, different things are driving them. Okay? But it's a revealed information game. So I'm going to say that I think I 
can get an L over D max of 21. Right? I decided that. I don't know if I can get an L over D max of 21. I think I can. I expect it. That's my ear engineering judgment based on heuristic information. I need a miracle data from the past. Or maybe I have some analysis that I've done. I've got a quick, you know, vortex lattice code with a simple viscous method. Whatever. I think I can get that. But I'm uncertain about that. I may be very confident. I may not be very confident. Now I say I'm going to design it to get 21 is 1 over D max. But because I don't trust myself, I say, actually, I'm going to design it to get an L over D max of 20. Well, I've now just made it harder to get that L over D max of 21. I walked away. I set a different loss limit. Because if I get 20, I'm like, yay, I'm happy. Sorry, I just said it. Um, but if I don't get 20, I'll work a little bit harder. If I get 21, I'm ecstatic. But I'm less likely to get there because each time I iterate, I make the design tweaks, I'm only aiming for 20 now. Well, if I'm aiming for a lot, uh, L over D max of 21 or 20, and you're aiming for a wing weight, 20 times, I get 20.5. Your weight weight is all of a sudden 23 times. You can't make it anyway. We're up a creek. Right? I might have been able to get an L over D max of 22. Well, that might have completely negated the loss on the 20 ton, on the 20 ton wing weight. Okay? So, talk to you much more about that. We're going to, we're going to do more about that. We're looking at building 4 3 and all about that stuff. So, um, there's a dice game that's actually really great to play. It's a revealed information game. It has absolutely no, it's totally, totally probabilistic. There's nothing you can do in rolling the dice that won't get you, say, beaten to a pulp that can affect it. But the way you reveal information and the way you make decisions and what you do affects your outcome. So. Um, but we'll like, okay, okay. So that's my little aside there. Um, on the constraints diagram, why do we place it down to the right? And it's really minimized. We're not maximizing performance because that's up and to the left. We're up or whatever. We're kind of in the center of the space. We're not maximizing efficiency. That's not in there. Obviously, we're not trying to maximize cost. I uh, heard a talk a number of years ago. Uh, if you're an aircraft structural engineer, what is the one thing you never hear? The one word your boss will never tell you to do, but almost never, about your structure. Make it, yeah? Heavier? Heavier. Yeah. You almost never hear make it heavier. Uh, the chief structural engineer for the 747 large, whatever, LCF, the one that made it uglier. Are you talking about the Dreamlifter? Yes, the Dreamlifter. That's their commercial name. He actually told the guys designing for a pressure bulkhead to make it heavier because of other things. But yeah, it's rarely that you want to minimize or maximize weight or any of those things. Okay. Here's a little bit of a hint. This is why it's in tables two and three. Down to the right does not make our aircraft the least expensive way to serve. In reality, the way engines perform and aircraft aerodynamics perform with respect to Mach number and altitude does not behave that way. The point is actually somewhere up here for most aircraft. But if you don't have that information, you don't have that level of detail to set it somewhere else, don't set it somewhere else. Okay. So we don't have that level of information. We're not that bright yet. We don't have that sophistication. By the way, there are papers on that. You can find it. You can look it up. That's why it's in those tables. 
Where on this chart do I set my design point? 45% of you have said the intersection of climb and takeoff, which I believe is there. 32% of you said the intersection of landing and takeoff, which is there. 27% of you said the intersection of cruise and climb, which is there. 23% said anywhere on the takeoff line. And landing and climb, there. I think that's all of them. Is that correct? Have I missed any other ones? Any other evil ones? That I know what the problem is. I have stepped on a thing that a cable is coming out of and interrupted a network connection. <sighs> oh, and then 5% of you said a thrust weight ratio of 0 0.5 and a wing loading of five kilonewtons per meter squared. So let me log back in. So we go one six. And the funniest part is this actually works. Do this. this is really good. I really like this. We have a thing where the natural part of the floor, someone might walk over, screws everything up. I mean we are winners here today. Just remember, right now I represent as the body corporate this organization, so it is my fault as much as anyone else's. Okay, so which of these are actually valid of the ones I gave you? Right now I gave you that intersection and that intersection. Okay, that's valid. But those are not the only valid places. Why is anywhere on the takeoff line not valid? Why is that not a valid for here? There are, there are some parts of the takeoff line that don't fit within the, within the active design space. Yes, we're off this in it. The constraint is inactive here, inactive there. Yeah. This is not down to the right. 0.5 and 5 is up in the middle of space. You don't have any other information to say that's right. Okay? So that's what I'm looking at. Now, I like nice round numbers. It, you only have so many significant figures. You do not need to say the thrust to weight ratio if it comes out to be 0 0.276242526 whatever it happens to be. It's 0.275, right? Yep. Use appropriate significant figures. So it doesn't have to be perfectly on the active constraint and round, or ceiling is it more appropriate in this case. Go up one little bit, because down puts you in the inactive space. Um, I don't care about that, but it needs to be pretty darn close. So don't you put it, you know, a little bit there, or there, or there, or there, or there, or there, not here, or here, or here, or here. Okay? That's all it is. Okay. Before we get on to configuration design, um, which is in my opinion, fun, but not as critical to you passing. Alpha and beta we talked about before. They are the thrust laps and the weight fraction at that constraint point. How do five abreast aircraft balance? Uh, turns out, regardless, the five abreast, you're not that far from the center line. You know, the two extremes, it's just the, you only have a slight weight difference near the center line. It doesn't change much. I can put a sandbag in the cargo hold. In fact, most aircraft carry around a lot of sand just to balance other things fore and aft. So we don't worry about side to side nearly as much. The, the losses as much as fore and aft. How do we find the wing area from the weight estimation? So I have a weight estimation, 81 tons. I have a wing loading of 5 kilonewtons per square meter. 5 kilo, 81 tons is roughly how many kilonewtons? 81 tons. Uh -huh. 81,000 kilograms. First order, what will we 
we say let's sir? I did I use I use my computer as a calculator and I got myself seven hundred and ninety four thousand three hundred and thirty eight point six five meters. Okay, so one significant figure that's eight eight hundred kilonewtons. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if it's five newtons per kilonewtons per meter squared, eight hundred divided by five is um, eight hundred divided by five is one hundred and sixty. Sixty square meters. Make your wing area. If my thrust to ratio, uh, thrust to weight ratio is 0.3, and I have two engines, what is the thrust I need? Okay, let's make it easier. It's 0 0.5. 800 kilonewtons, 0.5. How many kilonewtons of thrust do I need? Yes. You need around you need around four hundred kilonewtons. Okay. Which well, some engines even exceed. Oh yeah, yeah, we well, have plenty of big engines. It's just ridiculous with this aircraft. Um, I have two engines, I need four hundred total kilonewtons. How many do I need per engine? Two hundred. Yeah, that's all it is. Simple. I can't find the slide of questions on Blackboard. I mean, we will get to that in just a second. What is rotation distance? Okay. Takeoff consists of three phases. The first one, this is a normal takeoff, not a rejected one, is acceleration down the runway till I reach the speed at which I can rotate. Go back, stick, there we go. Computer says yes, the nose comes up, eventually. As I'm still accelerating, I reach the point at which I now am generating more, as much or more, actually just slightly more lift than I weigh, and the aircraft comes off the ground, and then it climbs until it crosses the screen at the end of the road. This is a magical screen that's there, 35 feet for part 25, or 50 feet for a part 23 aircraft, or the relevant meters. That time, that distance I cover while I'm doing the rotation is the rotation distance. We're not really counting that. Of course, you also have the other option, is you have to accelerate. You go, oh crap, I lost an engine, something's wrong, and I stop. That's a different one, but it's standard takeoff. We do that, that's the rotation distance. Okay. Okay. Wing area, rotation distance. I will show you Slido in two seconds. Yeah, there are computer sessions every week, including week 12. Yeah, so yeah, there's plenty of things. Uh, we'll talk more about submitting code next week and in the session next week. Where is the wing loading? It's the, the W over S. Weight over S in your constraints diagram. Uh, keep getting a weight estimate of 500 tons. Uh, you might be. Um, please come tomorrow and we can discuss it because um, there's probably a simple error somewhere. Units! <laughs> um, that's usually your first one. Okay, Slido questions on Blackboard. Um, so, oh, access denied. I do not have privileges to see my own stuff. Um, while we're doing that, Join this Slido. That's one eight four six one nine. Or is so wonderfully said. So let's go to. Student preview. Okay. So this is supposedly what you can see. And we'll go to week by week. And we'll scroll down and down and down and down and down. Let's choose week three just because I'm there. And we have this. And you have your Slido recap. And then we say it uses cookies. And there you go. All of the Slido stuff. 
Okay. Okay. So. How do I get out of this? I don't want settings. I have managed to figure out something I don't know. Okay. First poll. Uh, we'll do that later. Um, we can come back to that next week. Oh, almost step. So, we have two standard configurations. Anybody remember what they are? Yeah. Sir, the two standard configurations we have are the, are by our wings with engines slung under and four of the piece of four of, of a hot thin high aspect ratio wing. Yep. And a clean high aspect ratio wing, where the engines are placed at the back of the plane. Okay. Are those the only configurations we have? Absolutely not. Actually, yeah, they might be. No, I mean, no, we have of course they're not. the engines under the wing, as in attached to the bottom, all the cotton cord. Not flat today. We have the wings, engines inside the wing. Like the comet? Yeah. Um, and then you have some other weird description stuff. But yeah, so those are our two standard configurations. Okay, so, 707 was the first commercial transport to enter service with the engines mounted in the cells, slung beneath and forward the wing, and they are, the distance they are beneath and forward the wing is designed to minimize interference drag, which weren't very good at estimating back in the day. Since then, as the engines have gotten larger, they've become what we call more closely coupled. They're coming closer to the wing, there is more interference, but we're tailing that appropriately. What commercial transport, sold in large numbers, has very closely coupled engines? They're very close to the wing. I mean, very large. 737? 737. So that is a bit of an oddball design because it's hard to lengthen the landing gear. The engines got bigger. They had to do that. It was enabled by what we would now call CFD. It was potential flow and now full viscous CFD that's enabled us to do. The Sioux Aviation Caravelle is the first one to have the nice clean wing with the engines mounted at the back. Okay. Down the comment. It's dead end. What what did it have? Where were its engines? Sir? Yeah. The engines were mounted literally inside the wings, very close to the root. They were at the root of the wing. Uh, why are these two? Uh, really? What's different about them? They're piston ships. Well, that's not. That's piston. How about Hawker Sidley Trident? What was it known for? It has a lot of cool things. Three engines. So, but what about the third engine? Huh? Yeah, that's the S-stuck. It was the first of the S-stuck aircraft. Uh, there is a version of the Hawker Sidley Trident that has four engines. There's a little booster that sits above the third engine, because it couldn't take off. Um, Bach 111 is of, BAC 111 is of the same type of design as the caravel. Now, we are seeing fewer and fewer of that nice clean wing 
engine mounted at the back designs. They really only reside now in business space. And that is because the environment in which we design and fly our aircraft in has changed. No longer do we typically land in a field where all there is is tarmac and a hut. We don't have to carry our ground support equipment with us. When Boeing was designing the 727, it was designed to replace DC-3s. DC-3s fly in all sorts of crappy places. It needed to carry its ground support equipment with it. Same with the DC-9. That means it had to have air stairs. It was the first transport with an APU so that it could start itself in a remote field. It was low enough to the ground, they literally could walk up and unload the bags standing on the ground. We don't have that problem anymore. There are stairs that can be wheeled up. Unless you're Ryanair, you don't want that. You have to carry your own. Um, there are baggage loaders. There's all sorts of things. So we don't need that aircraft to be close to the ground anymore. So we don't. We can deal with it not clean wing. The other reason that the clean wing uh, was, especially with early engines, hot high performance was really poor. And having a clean wing allowed you to get out of hot high airports by the DC-10. Okay, uh, there is an entire story on why these two aircraft ultimately precipitated the chain of events that led to the 737 MAX crashes. Doesn't mean that it was guaranteed to happen. I mean, you still had to have Boeing fuck things up. But, um, yeah, if it hadn't been for those two aircraft and what happened there, we probably would have never reached the point where we had the MCAS system and its place that caused these accidents. Sir? Yeah. How can I research up the subject? Because you can't, because it's not written anywhere. Because um, I haven't had time to write it. No one has written it. Because it's, it, it's all there. You just have to dig it up and get some pieces. It's like a puzzle. Right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a cool puzzle. One of these days I'll actually do a lecture. <laughs> One of these days I'll actually think about doing a lecture. Okay. What are some of the problems with the engine configuration on the aft of the fuselage? That's the Sud Aviation Caravel 727, DC 9, CRJ, that kind of thing. And I am going to step on that plate again. Now this is important. Properties, sorry, not problems, properties. Some of you have airport combinations that might make it advantageous to do a rear fuselage, not convention. Some of you have some really love the airport. the most evil airport I've given you. Some people may have. Some of you have high altitude. Okay. So, is it lighter wing structure, better engine clearance, worse weight balance, improved hot high performance, easier terminal servicing, lighter fuselage structure, easier engine maintenance, or just random crap? So, 
So let's see what the correct answer be. Now, 94% of you, hold on, let me lock this. I need to get this in posterity. Aha! Before I locked it, 90% of you said it had the lighter wing construction. What determines the weight of the wing of an aircraft? Yes. The structure of the wing itself? What about the structure? What are wings critical in? What type of loading? Bending moments. And which bending moment is critical? Is it the tension or the compression? You all have had structures, and structures do. You all did design one, or whatever we call it this year. Do structures tend to fail in tension or compression? Anybody got a piece of paper? Anybody got a piece of paper? Just a nice. Don't look tear anything out of a notebook. Do I have a piece of paper in my back? This is my one of my favorite structural teaching things. You can see I spent time as a structural engineer. Aha! The union has kindly provided us <laughs> some paper. Enough is enough to support our strike. We're not striking right now. It's the universities who talked to three days. Okay. Contention, pulling, compression, pushing. Has it failed? No. Or not that strong. Has it failed? No. No. Has it failed? No. Is this a structure you want? No, not in the slightest. Yeah, it's failed. It failed in compression more often. By the way, way is simple to fix that. You want to make it a lot stronger? Reinforcements. Nope. Now the, the ends are what's called crippling, but that middle piece takes a lot more weight. Just hold it. Ah! Folding? Yep, just having to fold the joint, uh, bend. Okay. So, wings fail in bending, and they fail in compression. Compression is the top surface, because the wing wants to do that. Occasionally, you see the wing actually do that. It's bad. So, what's one way we can lighten the structure? We can put mass out on the wing. It's called inertial relief. What is a great source of inertial relief? What's a nice, big, heavy thing? We can hang off a wing. Don't say bomb. You can do that too. <laughs> yeah. Engines. So it turns out, putting engines on our wing, all else remaining equal, makes our wing lighter. Now, yes, we do have weight for the attachments and stuff. Turns out, if you put engines further away from the fuselage, we can make a lighter wing. It has problems with controllability on the engine side, the tail, all that stuff. That's why the original A330, A340 wing was not really good, because you had a wing designed to hold four engines, but also only hold two. So you had to design it with less for less inertial relief and with the attachment points further out. Um, but you know, reasonable sense. Ah, very clearly, better engine clearance. Worse weight and balance, because I've got a lot of weight at the extreme. So you will notice aircraft that have those engines mounted on the fuselage. The wing is much further back. Versus aircraft with wing mounted engines and a big bulb in the front, 747, the wing is further forward. They do have improved high performance. Two reasons. One, I have a nice clean wing. Aerodynamically, it's generally better, unless you can deal with, you understand the vortex interaction and can make that to your, to your advantage. Also, because the wing is further back, you tend to have more rotation capability. So I can come closer to the theoretical seal on that Because it's lower, easier terminal surface. Fuselage is heavier because I'm hanging engines off the back. We're not bending in the same way. They bend down. We don't like to do that. Um, away from that. And engine maintenance is often a bit harder because they're higher up all else for me. Okay. Simple. Pull two. 
and that later will destroy shreds. We don't care about that as much. We have a lot more ground support. Okay. Which type of derivative? Oh, by the way, someone's using the list. We'll see if it opens. Uh, and 100% of you get this right, of six. And the reason why is we're making more use of the existing structure. When we shrink a fuselage, we are carrying all of that design around for that heavier, larger head. We have a wing that's bigger than it needs to be. It's spies to carry more weight, all of that stuff. Can anybody name the one truly successful shrink derivative? In fact, until recently, it was more successful, they sold more of them, than they did in the original. It's only when they up the max tape up what you feel the past the original did so well. So for sure. Very, very successful aircraft. In fact, today, I believe it is that manufacturer's most successful twin aisle. Sub derivative. Yeah, sub derivative. Yeah. That would be since they all Yeah. It has to be a kind of A330, right? It is. The 200? Yeah, the A330 200. It is a shrink. It is very successful. It's a very capable error. Don't get me wrong. It also has no competition no in competition. its market segment. No competition? No. The 6, 7, 400 is a different market segment design. And so it's very successful. It's extremely successful. Other ones, A318, abject failure. 737, 6. Not very good. A319 Neo, pretty much a failure. Remember the 320s are base design. 727 200LR, didn't sell that many. We never got a 7, a 777 100, because Boeing was for a 757 100, because they realized it just didn't make sense. Okay. How many derivatives of the 737? And yes, a whole lot is an appropriate answer. But I'm looking for a slightly more sophisticated answer. Now, you could argue there's more or less, depending on how you define subderivatives, but we're talking the main derivatives. So I'm not differentiating 900 from 900 ER even though it has a different amount of pressure bulkhead, therefore a longer cavity. So we all know about the 737 Next Gen, the 737 Max, the 737 Classic. There's also um, what some people refer to as the Jurassic, as in it's so old, it's from the Jurassic. Back when the rocks were young. We're talking the 200? When you mentioned the Jurassic. Okay. I just wanted to know if, I was just wondering if you know if I was right. Yeah, 200 is what people would call one of the Jurassic. Models. Wait, the 200 is the very first derivative of the view. Is the very first chapter of 737 is the actual service, right? Nope. Oh, the 100 was. We don't actually so 12 that. is our safe bet. So you have the 100, the 200, the 300, the 400, the 500. 600, 700, 800, 900. 7, 8, 9, 10, 12. Or is that 13? <laughs> Maybe it's 13 and I can't count. Oh, yeah, 12 or 13, depending on how you count things. Interesting thing about the dash 7 over the dash 700. Uh, the airline that bought it. And I think there really is only one airline that bought the Dash 7. Used to never fly an aircraft that sat less, sat more than 149 passengers. Because they wanted it to be the case that any 
crew, flight and cabin crew, can be swapped onto any aircraft in their fleet at the last minute. If you go from 149 to 150, you need an extra flight attendant. They didn't want to do that. Since then, they decided they were going to fly some aircraft that were bigger, 189 seats. So all of a sudden, this aircraft that only sat max 149, which is the Dash 700, which was certified for, wasn't sensible. So Boeing actually stretched the aircraft just enough to allow more people in it to trigger it up above. It wasn't very successful. They haven't sold that many. Uh, and it still isn't certified. Okay. A320 derivatives. Six or seven, depending on how you count. And the reason I say depending on how you count is do you count the original or not? Yeah. Okay. And we do need to get out of here. Um, this is the last one. Why is the tube and wing so durable? Absolutely risk aversion. We are not willing to try something new because we don't want it to go wrong. I mean, you can look at that, the frame spacing on the A380s, for example, of that. Flexibility. Things like one and wing bodies only work really well with the CGs in one location. You don't have a tail. Tube and wing, I can put the CG a lot of different places. That tail allows me to take that without too much of a drag. The rest of this stuff. It's in the eye of the beholder on some things. Turns out the efficiency of a tube and wing design right isn't much worse than one wing body at its peak, but it's a lot better off design. There's all the trade offs, right? Yep. What is the most famous, not commercial, blended wing body party that flying today? The V2. It's not flying wing, it's not. Okay, um, so Q&A. Why would you want to shrink an aircraft? What advantages are there? Uh, it allows you to serve longer distances. For the same design, 737 uh, SP. It's the best, it's got the really good people looking one. A330-200 is probably the most successful. Uh, what are the two standard configurations? That's Wings on the end with engines underneath and the like, I think we asked that. A318 is one of the skank. Is that shakiest? I, I'm not quite sure what that is. Interesting. Can we do island hops in our designs? We have to do a trans Pacific A320. Ah! So, you need to try to do each of your segments, each market, each way, non stop. I don't care if your aircraft is stupid, right? If you cannot make it work, you cannot close it, that is no skin off your back, just like the stupid aircraft is no skin off your back. But what you then need to do, if you need to make a stop, in the city to the Caribbean, you will probably have to make a stop. Going from London City, you need to tell me where that stop is, and you need to size accordingly. So for instance, London City to JFK, they cannot carry enough fuel on the A318 to get to JFK. They stop in Shannon. Not very far. The A318 can make it the other way, no problem. From JFK is one in the city. What they then do is they clear immigration and customs, immigration and customs in Shannon. Theoretically makes it quicker than you You still have to deal with Long Island Expressway and getting to Manhattan to take you another day. But, you know, so you need to tell me that. It's no skin if you have to do it, but you then need to tell me what it is and all.